Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. And welcome to part two of our debate about carbon pricing. We're joined now by our two guests. Stefan Baum is the director of the Essex Sustainability Institute and professor in management and sustainability at the University of Essex in the United Kingdom, which is where he joins us via web camera. Also joining us is Nigel Topping. He serves as the executive director of the CDP, which was formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project, that says it is working to transform the global economy so that it operates within environmental limits. He joins us from Geneva, Switzerland. Thank you both for joining us, gentlemen. Let's turn to some news because there was a huge deal struck between China and Russia, and essentially it's going to be the, one of the largest pipelines between the two countries um, for, for, for natural gas. They're supposed to deliver billions of, of cubic meters of gas for the next 30 years. Stefan, does this example suggest that we are in a moment essentially where fossil fuel extraction is actually increasing and, and still extremely profitable? Well, one should say that... Um China has been driven by coal, uh, coal-based uh, energy and fossil fuel. So they've been they've been opening uh, a coal, uh, a coal uh, uh, electricity station, uh, you know, every every other week. Uh, so the the switch to gas is is on the face of it uh, not a bad thing. However, um, I think a gas-based uh, e economy, and that's also the, the basis of the argument for supporting fracking, for example, uh, which is, has been expanding in the US and now the UK government would like to do the same. You know, that's the argument, you know, we need to move from coal to gas and that's a good thing because it will buy us uh, maybe 20, 30 years so that we can uh, have more time to implement uh, uh, renewable energy policies and uh, develop new green technologies. I think that's a dangerous road to travel on. Why? Because uh, scientists are, uh, climate scientists are telling us we actually need to move rapidly from coal, from gas, from oil to towards uh, green renewable technologies. And we need to do it now. And that's, for example, what the, the German government has understood. There have been many teething problems in what they call the energy transition, but Germany is leading the way in Europe to to implement uh, renewable energies, and and they are now 25, 30 uh, percent into into that goal of having 60 or 70 percent by by 2050. So it is it is working if there's political will, and gas is. I think delaying the inevitable that you will eventually need to put money and political will behind renewable energy. Yeah, and I want to ask the same question to Nigel. It, it seems like this it's still extremely profitable to use gas. And um, with that, do you really feel like cap and trade will, will offset um, some, some of this, these carbon emissions um, in the long run? So let, let, let's unpick this a bit. First of all, what, what we, I think, are all agreeing is that um, we need to reduce emissions very significantly. The scientists say we need to reach a peak emissions by 2020 and then reduce very significantly with a, with a, with a, net, with a goal of net zero um, in the second half of the century, right? And maybe 80% reduction by 2050. And that is the stated goal of several countries uh, and increasingly a number of cities and a number of companies. Um, uh, there are many ways to do that. One of the most powerful is one way or another to put a price on the pollutant. Remember the pollutant, the polluter pays principle. If something's bad for society, then the people who produce it should pay. So whether that's a carbon tax, an effective cap and trade scheme or clear product standards, those are all ways of making sure that the polluter pays. In this, the, the specific question about natural gas, I think, I think Stefan's you know, addressed the main points. Coal is by far the worst polluter of the fossil fuels. Um, you know, China recently announced that it's banning certain of the dirtiest types of coal, those with a high sulfur and ash content. That's bad news for people who are mining those. So that effectively puts an infinite price on them as far as China's concerned. Um, and so that will have an effect, a negative effect on companies who are mining those. But it's a good decision as far as the climate's concerned. China's also said that in its next five-year plan, it will see peak coal. As Stefan says, China's the largest user of coal in the world. But over 40% of the world's coal is used by China. Much of the investment in coal in the last 10 years has been driven on the assumption that China will keep growing forever. China's just said that it's going to start going to reverse gear. Again, bad news if you're producing coal. Um, 
But the, the issue of oil is one which has got investors very, very interested. Gas is generally seen as a transition fuel, um, replacing dirty coal um, and, and doing a job in the period between now and when we can ramp up renewable investments to the level of a trillion dollars a year, which is what we need to put in the renewable infrastructure to give us the reduction we need by 2050. The case of oil is very interesting. Um, it's kind of the, it's, it's the one in the gray area. Um, what investors are, are understanding now is that we won't be able to burn all of the oil that we've currently discovered and emit all of its CO2 unless we can find a way to invest very aggressively in what's called carbon capture and sequestration, the technology to store the CO2 underground. So that means that there's a, a growing question amongst investors as to whether or not oil companies are sitting on some assets, some oil fields which have not yet been developed, which may end up not being able to be developed, which may become what we call stranded assets. So it's a very active debate in the investment community, examining at an asset level, an individual oil field level, whether or not um, those oil fields will be profitable over the lifetime and whether that's something which the investors should start to be worried about. So we're starting to see investors asking companies to slow down or stop the rate of investment and start returning dividends. So it's, you know, it's a very interesting form of, uh, you know, the fact that there's a, there's a that, that's driven by the expectation of, as the, the, the economist said a, a few months ago, that maybe this is the end of the super oil majors because the demand for oil can now seem to possibly be peaking as a result of fossil fuel growth, as a result of energy efficiency, um, and as a result of cap and trade schemes and carbon pricing schemes of one sort or the other, pushing the price of those fuels up and taking down the relative price of uh, Could I just come, come in there? Just to really quickly, Stefan. Yes, could I just come in and basically support what, what Nigel has just said there? But I think it's actually a much quicker way for us to address climate change if we have a large divestment strategy, divesting fossil fuels and investing, putting that money that we're saving that goes in on a daily basis into new explorations uh, in the Arctic, in, in deep ocean drilling, etc., etc., into fracking, etc. Yeah, we, we're talking billions that are mobilized each day to go into the status quo. If we're actually using that, divesting from, from the status quo, investing into the future, we make much, much quicker progress than uh, inventing a very complex system, cup and trade, CDM, and all sorts of uh, fanciful systems that so far many people would argue have not delivered the goods. Now, yesterday, I think it was announced that the Rockefeller family are divesting from uh, fossil fuels to a large extent. Uh, now, that's uh, so a, that, they're, they're divesting from coal, which as we've explained is the worst culprit and is a dying market anyway, and oil sands, which are very high cost of extraction. It, and exactly. You know, the point, I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 there is a lot of pressure on these assets now, and it's because there's an expectation of increasing policies which will drive the price of carbon up and the relative competitiveness of fossil fuels down. So I think it's important that you can't just say what we need is mass divestment. That won't happen if it's going to lose pensioners' money. If you're the, sitting on the trustee of a public pension fund responsible for making sure that the 22-year-old teacher who's just joined your pension scheme is going to have a pension in 50 years and you irresponsibly divest their money from things which are going to um, earn the money for their pension, then you will rightly be out of a job. So we should be careful careful what we wish for. This needs to be managed in, a, in an orderly, transparent way, driving down the climate risk of pension portfolios by gradually divesting from the risky assets and, and, and investing in the ones which are uh, the right ones for the uh, fossil fuels. Absolutely. Fuel. And there will be losers. There will be social losers. And, that's, uh, and that requires... Uh, uh, policies that take people with them rather than working against people and that requires political leadership and we have been lacking as I'm sure you would admit to been lacking that leadership all major political parties uh, in the UK the country I know best um, are lacking this political leadership in the climate change policy area why is that that is that is a real 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 problem well, I think I think I think one of the reasons, and I think you've alluded to this, is that um, sometimes the the ear of the ear of the policymakers has been dominated by one set of voices. 
What we're trying to show, and we believe that the facts show it with this report we launched last week, is that there is a large and growing majority of businesses who recognise that we need to reduce our, um, our emissions to keep within the two degree goal, and that they need long term, clear, robust price signals to allow them to do that. Um, you make a really important point about um, some of the, the social dislocations that could come around as a result of poorly managed policy. California's got a very clever way of addressing this. 25% of the income from selling the allowances goes to um, disadvantaged communities. So it's a, it's, a, it's a way of taking some of the fiscal benefit of a cap and trade scheme and using it to, to, to make sure that some of the potential downsides um, uh, are, are addressed. Stephen, I want to ask you about that. Can you speak to that directly? What do you make of that 25% going to disadvantaged communities in California? Well, I mean, that's great. That's always been the ambition of, of uh, the CDM, for example. The CDM has written into uh, uh, its protocol that uh, you know it should uh, support sustainable development goals in the developing world. Unfortunately, uh, very little of that has been actually happening. The money the technology transfer and the finance has gone into the uh, uh, you know the, the big companies uh, enriching elites in places like India, which I've studied quite closely in a number of uh, cases there. So I, 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 I welcome that. But let us not forget, Nigel, uh, uh, you know, companies part of the EU ETS, and that's the system I know best, and, and we, we shall see what's happening in California. They have actually made billions of windfall profits uh, in some industries from this cap and trade system. Uh, why? Because there have been over allocations of, of allowances. Uh, certain uh, uh, industries. So have... this, this, is, this is old ground. Everybody, everybody agrees on this. These are flaws in the design. And, and, and a, any system, but... any policy which doesn't deliver a long term, clear, Robust price signal to the market will not help us address climate change. Whether so, that's a Nigel, efficient standards, a ratcheted carbon tax, or a clear declining cap with a trading mechanism. But so what about a regulatory board? board? Would, would you be for that, price. Nigel? Would you be for something like that, or some sort of regulatory board to oversee any of these, or any of this fraud or corruption? Look. Um, any any law, any fiscal system is is subject to the risk of corruption, right? This is not this is not a climate change question, right? It's a, it's a complete red herring. You know, any system is subject to corruption, and corruption is bad, right? It needs to be rooted out. So, um, you know, we need appropriate oversight. We need appropriate legal redress, of course, in any system. But, but what we need above all, and we must must stop avoiding this question, is we need one way or another, and. A thousand companies and investors, 73 countries, including China, um, and many, many cities have just signed in support of the World Bank statement saying we all want a price on carbon which is commensurate with the need to keep global warming within two degrees C. That's okay, what we this, need. There are many story. ways of doing it. They're all complicated. They all involve trade-offs. But without the political will, and that's what businesses and cities are demanding now, is that national leaders in the UNFCCC process, step up. Um, and as Leonardo DiCaprio said in the launch event at the UN yesterday, you know, history is either going is, history is either going to recognise the leadership of these national leaders, or it's going to vilify them. So Stephen, the time I'll... now and is for is for action from everybody, from businesses, from mayors, and from national governments. We've All got right. price to carbon one way or another. Stefan, I'll let you have the final word. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I would agree with what Nigel just said. The political will is absolutely crucial. Uh, we need that. Now, the World Bank statement on carbon pricing uh, excludes a lot of voices. And I think it's an important point to make. So if you look at the very short list of NGOs supporting that carbon pricing statement, that worries me. It basically means it's a, it's a partisan statement and it's not a bipartisan statement. It excludes a lot of people um, who, over the last uh, so, so, so uh, do you, twenty do, years, do you disagree that we need a carbon price which is which will which will deliver the investment for a two degree world. Nigel, you know, before uh, we get to that point, let let me just let Stefan finish his point about these NGOs not signing up. Why why aren't they? 
well, why exactly? Why are Greenpeace, why are Friends of the Earth, why are a lot of other environmental NGOs not signing up to this pr uh, program? Because they're very, very worried about the double speak of, of, of many companies, uh, the, the many profit opportunities that these carbon pricing mechanisms are, 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 uh, are uh, bringing to, to, to the fore. And, and we haven't simply seen the uh, the effective mechanism that is being promised and it's impacting it's impacting having negative impacts uh, for example in the develop, developing world and a lot of my work has been around showing from the ground how carbon offsetting for example which is a carbon pricing mechanism how it has affected negatively communities in the developing world and I think that's something that's not a design flaw that's part of the design of carbon pricing and that's why Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace and many other uh, 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 social movement based uh, groups are not signing up to this because they're very, very suspicious of what the World Bank together with companies uh, are, are putting forward here. Stefan, just quickly speak to that example. You, you said that on the ground you've seen it happening where these carbon offsets aren't producing the results that they claim to be yielding. Speak to well, that. Give me, let, let me give you a very, very uh, uh, concrete example. So uh, in, in one of my books called Upsetting the Offset, uh, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Tamara Gilbertson, has uh, written a very good case study researched on the ground in Thailand. It's a CDM project with finance from uh, Japan and Europe that has... Um, uh, invested in green electricity production, turning rice rice husk, uh, which is was well, seen as a waste pro product, into green green electricity production. Now it all sounds good on paper, but when you actually go onto the ground, then you see that the rice husk uh, that is being used to burn to generate so-called green energy is actually not a waste product. It's used by local peasants as a fertilizer. Now, this rice cut is now not available as a fertilizer, which means the, these peasants need to buy in chemical fertilizers, which are, of course, fossil fuel based, creating more emissions. Um, so we, we, we're creating a kind of a perverse incentive system where rice cut is suddenly becoming a, a commodity uh, in order to produce so-called green energy. But the people on the ground uh, uh, emitting more emissions, creating more problems, having less money in their pocket because the rice cask is being taken away from them. So it's just a very small example I see. that a lot of things that are, uh, uh, by the look of it, green are not actually green when you study them in detail. And you need to actually go into the communities in India, in Bangladesh, in Thailand, in Brazil, in China, where these CDM and other carbon offsetting projects are taking place. And carbon offsetting is an essential part in carbon pricing strategies. All right, we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to pause the conversation here. Um, Stefan Baum, as well as Nigel Topping, thank you very much for this informative debate. Thank, thank you, you, Jessica. Thank, thank you, Stefan. Good evening. Thanks very much, Nigel. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.